Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Everyone talks about dental decay at one time or another, and usually they're talking about the caries problems of a particular individual. But how do we talk about dental decay of a group of individuals, or of a school population, or of a city, or even an entire country? As it has been shown that dental disease is almost universal, and that an overwhelming majority of the world is affected by one kind of oral problem or another, a standardized method for describing and comparing dental disease patterns would seem necessary. In dentistry, several methods of measuring dental disease have been developed. These are called indices. An index provides a uniform way to describe the characteristics of a particular dental problem. It's necessary for the dentist to know the patterns of disease occurrence in various communities or in special population groups in order to plan, to conduct, and to evaluate activities which are directed toward the prevention or control or research. The particular index we are going to describe here is perhaps the most well-known way of measuring dental caries experience in children. It's commonly called the DMF index. It consists of a standardized way of conducting and recording a dental examination. The DMF index is generally used to examine large groups of school-aged children, usually between the ages of 5 and 15. The procedure is characterized by three features, standardization, simplicity, and speed. Let's look at standardization first. The object of the index is to count the number of decayed, filled, extracted, and sound teeth present in the mouth at the time of examination. What does this tell us? It shows the individual's past and present experience with caries. This seems simple enough to do, but what may look like decay to one examiner may not look like decay to another. For example, two examiners checking the same patient may find differing amounts of caries present. How can we overcome this problem? Well, actually, the problem of differing examiners cannot be entirely eliminated. But having standardized criteria by which to examine, we can reduce the problem to an acceptable level. The DMF index, then, has some standardized procedures by which different examiners in different situations working on different population groups can have some reliable basis for comparing their findings. Here then is the exam procedure which can be carried out by as few as two people plus the patient. One person serves as an examiner and the other as a recorder writing the findings. The dental examination is done by a dentist or a dental hygienist with a mouth mirror and an explorer. Available light is generally used for the procedure. If the exam is done out of doors or near a window, natural light is preferred. If natural light is not available, a portable light source may be employed. Before looking at the standardized criteria, for use during the dental examination. Let's look at the simplicity of this exam. There are two ways in which the decayed areas can be considered. We can record each surface as decayed or sound, or we can record each tooth as decayed or sound without specifying the surface containing the decay. This latter way is the simpler of the two and is the one we will use here. It is sometimes referred to as the DMFT, with the T standing for tooth as opposed to surface. Any dentist or hygienist or student capable of using a mirror and explorer 
in a clinical exam can, by employing these minimum materials and personnel, carry out a successful survey. The following list, although apparently long, is considered essential for even a simple exam. In addition to the examiner and the recorder, we need a stool about 30 inches high, two straight back chairs, a portable headrest that can be attached to the back of the chair, a large waste basket, about 30 to 35 mouth mirrors, about 30 to 35 explorers, single-ended number 23, a chip blower, some cloth or paper towels to place these instruments on, two pans, porcelain or plastic, for sterilizing the instruments, two large basins, either plastic or porcelain, plastic is preferred, four to six pencils, number two, lead, and a table cover, which can be cloth, paper, or plastic. We also need abundant amounts of record forms, paper towels, paper cups, and some sterilizing solution. It's optional whether gowns are worn or whether a portable light source is used. The teeth are examined starting from the upper right third molar space and continuing across the upper arch to the upper left third molar space. The examiner then drops to the lower arch beginning with the lower left third molar space and continues around to the right side of the patient's mouth and ends with the lower right third molar space. Every tooth is checked for decay. The condition of the teeth or tooth spaces are classified into six mutually exclusive categories. These are unerupted, decayed, filled, extracted, indicated for extraction, and sound teeth. These conditions are given the numerical code 0 through 5, respectively, for the permanent teeth. Any deciduous teeth present are classified as follows, decayed, filled, indicated for extraction, and sound. These conditions are numbered 6 through 9, respectively. Any missing deciduous tooth is assumed to have been exfoliated naturally, since the examiner has no sure way of knowing how the tooth was actually lost. These are the criteria for the classifications. Any unerupted or empty space would be called unerupted if there's no tooth, or if the tooth is congenitally missing, or has been lost for causes other than caries. A carious tooth is one which is, has clinically visible decay, or a pit fissure or cavity that catches a sharp explorer or one that has both a filling and decay. In this case, it's counted carious only. A filled tooth is one with a metal, silicate, or plastic filling, and no evidence of decay. A tooth is counted extracted if it is extracted due to caries only. A tooth is marked indicated for extraction if it has retained roots or total coronal destruction or an exposed pulp chamber. A tooth is marked sound if it is an erupted tooth without fillings and without decay. It should be noted that a tooth to be considered erupted must have its occlusal surface or incisal edge completely exposed or easily exposed by lifting the remaining tissue flap with an explorer. The examiner must dictate to a recorder using a record form, a total of 32 number codes corresponding to the conditions in which he finds each of the 32 spaces. Supernumerary teeth are not counted, even though they may be carious. When both a permanent tooth and a deciduous or supernumerary tooth occupy the same space, 
only the permanent tooth is considered. It is not necessary for the examiner to identify each tooth by name as he examines it. It's sufficient for him to dictate only a condition for each tooth space, which he is examining according to the previously mentioned sequence. A good recorder will follow along with the examiner filling in in the dictated numbers on the record form in the appropriate spaces. In order to keep in sequence with the recorder, the examiner says the word check after he has examined the following three teeth. The upper right central incisor, the upper left third molar, and the lower left central incisor. In other words, when he crosses the midline of the upper arch, when he completes the upper arch, and when he crosses the midline of the lower arch. This is to verify if both the examiner and the recorder are at the same point in the exam sequence. Should the examiner and the recorder be out of sequence with each other, then the recorder says, stop, repeat. At this point, the examiner re-examines a quadrant he has just finished before continuing with the examination. This procedure avoids having to repeat the entire exam when a discrepancy in sequence is found. We've talked about standardization and simplicity. Now let's look at speed. While, the following, while following the foregoing procedures, it is important that the examiner and the recorder exchange as little conversation as possible between themselves. This reduces the chance for error and minimizes the fatigue of the examiner and increases the speed of the procedure. An examiner may check as many as 200 children in a day, which tires his vocal cords as well as the rest of his body. A well-executed exam can be completed in approximately two minutes. Let's look at an exam in progress. The patient's name and other necessary information have been taken and the recorder is ready to write the examiner's findings. It is important to verify the patient, with the patient the basic information such as name, age, and grade to assure that the patient corresponds to the record sheet. Zero, one, five, one, one, five, 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 check, five, 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 one, one, five, two, zero, check, zero, one, two, five, 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 stop, repeat, yes, oh. zero, one, two, five, 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 check, five, 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 one, one, two, one, and zero. It's okay. Thank you. After the examination, or at the end of the day, 
the number of decayed, filled, and extracted teeth are summed for each child on the record sheet. Those teeth which are recorded as indicated for extraction are counted as if they were already extracted and appear with the M or missing component of the DMF. The sum of the three components, that is decayed, missing, and filled, gives the patient's individual DMF score. We've seen a method for examining large groups of people for dental caries in a simple, fast, and above all, standardized way called DMF. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.